have some fun today talking about a few things we've heard people say to us. Are y'all ready? Did you put your chin straps on? <laughs> right here. Who's going to kick it off? I heard a great one this morning. I'm ready. Go for it. Let's do it. My doctor, or a doctor, I should say, in response to me complaining about something that was very serious, very, very serious to me, said, are you seeing a psychiatrist? Mm. That's always fun, you know? In other words, you might be crazy because we've done everything right over here on our side. Wouldn't it be awesome if everyone's ego in the medical community was equal size to their compassion? Mm -hmm. I wish that for everyone. Moving forward, what do you got, Kat? Mm, let me, I'll tag onto that. One of my favorites is, oh, I know what you mean. I, I know how you feel. It's one of my least favorite things to hear whether we're talking about Parkinson's or not because it shifts the focus away from whatever that other person's feeling mm -hmm. and making it about oneself. So I, I think in trying to be compassionate, sometimes our loved ones and, and, and people that genuinely care about us say, I know how you feel. And I, I don't always feel like that's compassion. I, don't know I would that's agree with that completely. It's almost like it's all about me and a deflection rather than really listening to you. I mean, they automatically go to, well, I have a hangnail too, and it really bugs me all, every day. <laughs> you know, it's just one of those deflections, which, which means that you can't really tell your story, no matter what symptom, no matter what aspect of the disease you talk about. Like, like the famous one I always get is, I really have a problem with fatigue and insomnia and always hear, you, you bet, you know, I got the same thing, right? I was up all night last night and it shifts right away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, akin to that, one of the ones that I had is it's almost code for I don't want to hear it, which is everybody's got something. Right. And, you know, yes. That is true, right? Everybody over a certain age probably has something. But Kevin, I like your hangnail metaphor. Uh, not everybody has something as serious as Parkinson's. Well, I actually, let me piggyback on that. I actually had a physician to tell me, oh, everybody has a tremor nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, really? That's oh. Or the other way around, it's like, I don't see a tremor, you must be fine. Yeah. That's like, I'm not hungry, there's no starvation. I had, a, <laughs> I had someone that I mentioned who found out I had Parkinson's, I mentioned it to them and they looked at me and I won't mention gender because they might be listening. <laughs> but they mentioned, uh, oh, well, you know, I have eczema and that's really tough. Mm. And yeah. I thought, Okay, thank you for sharing that. And you know what, to, just to support the people who do have eczema, it is tough to have eczema. No denying that. I know people who really struggle with eczema, but I'm, whatever the response is, the response I would have liked is, oh, that sucks. I'm so sorry. How are you doing? Versus telling me what you have. I don't need to know what you have. In that moment. Right, in that moment. No. Has anybody heard that? Oh, but you look so good. <laughs> That's just the one I was going to say. I get, you get that a lot. You say you have Parkinson's and they say, but you look great. And you're yeah. like, well, how did I look before this? <laughs> right. You're like, but, thanks. I but you know, that doesn't bother me, honestly. For me, that doesn't bother me so much. I'll tell you because people don't know what someone with Parkinson's necessarily looks like. And that's what we're doing mm -hmm. with the YOPD council. We're changing that. You wow. can't always tell, right? Mm -hmm. So changing the face of what Parkinson's looks like is really important. So that, that doesn't bother me so much. Give me another year. Maybe it will. There you go. Yeah, because I want to tell you that. It, that it, it's mostly actually, humorous. Oh, Michael. Yeah. That question actually, actually bothers me somewhat. And it, it's pretty much for the same reasons. Like what is a person with Parkinson's supposed to look like? And I, I just don't get it. Yeah. Maybe well, they're thinking mean, the little old men crept right. over, you know, right. that we've seen so often in the assessment with the little cane. I mean, that seems to be a lot of the stereotypical, you know, um, yeah. and, and none of us here fit that, right? 
Well, okay. I don't know. I can I can make that look pretty good these days. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the other one that, the other one that's that always... same theme when 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 you exercise, right? I mean, we all know that exercise is our mainstay. Right. And to hear people say, "Oh, I can't believe you just rode that bike," or "I can't believe you just ran that race," you must be fine, or you must be getting over your Parkinson's. Getting oh over. my gosh! Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, that's one of my uh, my favorites as well. I, I mostly get this from people that I are I've known for a long time, and they'll always ask, "Well, how are you feeling? Are you getting any better?" Yeah. Oh like, no! Well, you know, for me, that's just a teaching moment to say. You know, look, it, it, it's a progressively degenerative disease and progressive does not mean the positive progressive means it's getting worse. So, no, I don't get better, but I'm not getting as bad as I could, that kind of thing. So it gives me an opportunity to explain to them why exercise is important to Parkinson's, why what we eat, you know, how we behave and our attitude and all these other things that we we do as strategies to keep ourselves you know, in, in good enough shape to do things like this and, and everything else we try to do in, in everyday life. So you are such a class well, guy, <laughs> Tom. And um, I didn't handle it very well when I was newly diagnosed, but I had some well-meaning friends that didn't understand anything about Parkinson's. And every time we spoke on the phone, they would say, how are you? Oh. And I, I finally just told one of my best friends, I said, stop asking me that. What do you want me to tell you that my thumb is twitching more today than it was on Wednesday? And she's like, well, I was just trying to be a good friend. I was like, well, stop. <laughs> and, it's not um, working. <laughs> yeah. And so I didn't handle it very gracefully while I was coming to terms with my own diagnosis. Um, and I ended up sending an email out to friends and family, you know, when I realized what was going on. And that people didn't have any point of reference, frankly, other than Michael J. Fox. Um, they didn't have any other reference. I sent a big email out explaining, you know, I'm not dying tomorrow. I'm going to be living with this for a long, long time. And I am busy living, a, a you know, a busy and hassled life just like you. <laughs> so um, please don't treat me any differently. Yeah, you yeah. mentioned something that's uh, related to something that I always hear. So I, I have a tendency, especially being a person of color, to ask individuals, do they know anybody that has Parkinson's? Mm -hmm. And so I usually get, oh, yeah, my grandfather had it, but he died. Uh, <laughs> it's like, okay. what do you want to do with why, that? Why would, you say, why would you say that to me? Yeah. <laughs> why would you say that to anybody? Oh, I, hear they the died. Other, I hear the other way, Michael, is like, oh, my Uncle Bob lived with Parkinson's for 30 years, and he did fine. You'll be fine, too. Mm -hmm. And again, those kind of comments, I think, are said to make them feel more comfortable that we're really okay. Um, but but I, I, Robin, I did what you did. I sent an email to friends and family saying, listen, I don't want Parkinson's to be all we talk about every time we right. connect. Um, right. I'm happy to answer questions or to check in, but I don't want it to be like this, this other person in the room every time we're talking. And um, let's just keep it that way. And I promise to be upfront if you ask me a direct question. Um, you know, how are you feeling? How are the symptoms or whatever? Um, and it, it almost gave them permission to not have to bring it up. And I think mm -hmm. that was good. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, had a, I had a friend of mine. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, Heather. no, I had a friend of mine recently. We were on a WhatsApp, FaceTime, whatever video call. And she said, oh, you know, your head is doing something weird. Why is it shaking like that? And I, I love this friend dearly. She's been my friend for decades and she knows I have Parkinson's and I've sent an email. I've explained it. She's very familiar. And yet her way of saying that was like, okay, I, I just didn't know. I didn't even know how to respond to that. You know, I just told her, well, it's dyskinesia. Oh, but yeah, but it's a bit weird. It's odd. Why is it doing that? And I'm just like, you know, maybe you should just, and I had to call her up later and say, you need to be really careful with the way you say things because I'm pretty tough in many ways, but you saying something like that was really blunt and it made me feel very self-conscious. And I didn't want to actually talk to you after that or be on a video call with you. And then of course my dyskinesia got worse because I was like, and then my tremor became worse and, you know, and all of that sort of thing. And I'm just wondering how can someone who was so sensitive and so aware in so many ways just have gotten it wrong. And these are just, you, I can't be mad at her, but it's just a constant 
path of educating people, even people that you think would get it. And sometimes right. it's exhausting. Yeah. It's just exhausting. Right. And there's something called kinesia paradoxica. It's a phenomenon we see in Parkinson's disease where we experience these severe difficulties with movement because we are upset usually. Mm -hmm. You know, it's part of the whole process. And I remember Mike, my um, radio show co-pilot from the YOPN, Mike and Mike radio show, he said someone was getting brain surgery and then a guy walked up to him and said, did they get it? Oh. But it was DBS. So it's like people think it's going to be cured. They're hoping it's going to be cured. Or they'll say something like, but there's lots of research out now. There's cures, right? Like I, I heard it and on they're the They're close. Radio. They're close to the cure, right? And I'm like, I hear yeah, that all, all the time. Have you seen this, this study in lemurs in Reader's Digest? I read it and I know there's a cure around the corner. Lemurs. Well, and I, I think it's important here to do what I call listen for the love. Mm. That people are grasping to try to make themselves and us feel better. And they also try to ascribe, they try to explain the inexplicable or ascribe meaning to it. And some of the most hurtful comments I've had have been around trying to ascribe meaning to it. Things like it's God's will <laughs> or, you know, on the Judeo-Christian end of the continuum, you don't have enough, enough faith. And on the new age continuum, well, your soul chose this for this incarnation. And that kind of puts the locus of control in me, in self. Mm. And the reality is it isn't. <laughs> and um, it is a thing that we all have to deal with. But I try to listen for the love underneath because people sometimes say really ridiculous things, very well-intended and well-meaning. Sometimes you know, I have to do translations. You know, speaking of love, you know, my own mother gave me the most backhanded insult the other day. I was going through my divorce and she said, oh, Kevin, I just spoke to my friend. Her daughter is recently divorced too. You should reach out to her. You know, you're a good catch with the exception that you have Parkinson's, right? <laughs> it's like, whoa, wait a minute, mom. Hold on. I have an exception because I have Parkinson's? Ouch. I said, oh. that, that really hurt deep to the core. Mm -hmm. Because when your own family members say that, they mean well, but they're trying to kind of soften the blow. Yeah. Right. So how about, um, how about nonverbal questions? And I guess you know what I mean. So I'm going to give you an example. So you might be interacting with somebody, and they might know you have Parkinson's, Parkinson's and they'll come up to you and say, well, I thought that all people with Parkinson's had a tremor or, or something like that. The other thing is they don't really say anything, but the look on their face and it makes you feel self-conscious. So I've been um, we go tremor free before in a situation. And because they were looking at me kind of oddly, it, it made my tremor come out even more, even more. So there's still those nonverbal things because an expression will can get you every time. Yeah. You can like you're being the tested. Of the eyes, right? Yeah. And it's they're looking up and down the like, Parkinson's again, is it that you're thinking about? So let me jump in one more time because you just reminded me of something. Um I guess when I first got diagnosed or whatever, I, maybe I didn't look like I had it, but it was all I almost felt like the Parkinson's people were kind of like judging me. And it's like, well, what are you doing in here? Because you look so different. Because everybody in the room was um, white and mm -hmm. older, and so they they'll be like, oh, we thought you were the speaker. You don't, you know, you don't look like you have Parkinson's. That that kind of thing, right? Which which makes me really really self conscious and, and nervous. I've heard that a lot. I I, I guess uh, you know you don't look like you have Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. How how can you have Parkinson's? Um, or how can it be so bad? Look how well you're doing. Right, right. Like, what are you complaining about? Right. <laughs> the, it's so a, hard with the non-motor symptoms, mm -hmm. how much they affect our quality of life. And yet, you know, if my tremor is calm, everything must be great. Right. Mm. Yeah. I had a doctor, um, a movement disorder specialist mentioned to me early on in the disease that uh, I didn't look like I had Parkinson's. She couldn't tell. And it, I didn't have a lot of obvious symptoms then. So 
I was like, oh, whoa, maybe I don't have it. Maybe I'm the lucky one. Maybe I'm progressing so slow. It'll only hit me when I'm 80. And then if she were to see me now, like three to four years later, I'm like, you yeah, know, you can probably tell, you know, with the dyskinesia and the dystonia and many things. But I think for me, that's the hard part when people say you don't look like you have it. There's this moment of like, oh, mate, maybe, maybe I don't have it. Like I fall into that little delusional thinking still going back in my mind. Into the for river that of denial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was one of my favorite things someone ever said to me. I was in a support group when I first joined and I kept asking about diversity and they accused me of race baiting or whatever language they used. And all I was saying was, hey, where, where's the diversity here? We're all a bunch of white people sitting around talking. This disease doesn't discriminate. What's going on? I was literally just coming into a support group for the first time going, where are all the people of color? And they said, you don't even have Parkinson's. Oh, <laughs> all my heart. With all my heart, I wish you were right. I'm cured. I'm cured. Thank yeah. you. Woo! Thank you, man. <laughs> Mr. Administrator of this poor group who just kicked me out. We're asking a really simple question. Right. And that's a legitimate question, too. Right? Definitely. They were furious with me. Anyway. They strange. probably wouldn't have liked your jacket today either, Heather. Right? <laughs> Well, it wouldn't we, like Randy <laughs> Carlisle either then. We love your jacket. We love your jacket. I, I, I really so th those of you that are watching today, um, feel free to pop your uh, your favorite questions and that into the uh, chat and we'll try we'll pick up on those and uh, we can play this game together. So just wanted to point out that you can you can join the conversation. Has uh, anybody else? Oops, go ahead. I was saying, you know, if we don't have any bad, <laughs> horrible stories, what about maybe we can switch it to not right now, but what is one of the nicest or the best things someone has said to you in terms of Parkinson's, maybe towards the end? Yeah. Well, sometimes it's, it, it's, it's actions more so yeah. than, uh, or reactions to, to, to certain things. Like, um, like I typically board flights early as in, with the, uh, in, with folks that are impaired because as it comes closer to getting on the plane, I start to go downhill because I get nervous. So that gets real challenging. So I'm walking around the airport looking pretty good because I have Parkinson's. And then I go to get on the plane and I start freezing and stuff like that. So I try not to carry luggage and baggage with me. But um, and as I get on, I, and I froze one time really bad. I was stuck there and just staring at this guy. He jumps up out of his chair and he's like, he gets in my face and he says, what are you looking at? And I'm like, I, I, I can't move. I'm, I'm frozen. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I'll explain in a minute. Can you please take my bag? He took my bag and put it up. And I said, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to offend you in any way, but I have Parkinson's. And one of the things that happens to us is we freeze. In other words, I can't move. And he, he sat in front of me, but he came up later on as the flight went on. He sat next to me. He says, I want you to tell me more about this, this thing that you, you're talking about with Parkinson's. And I explained to him, and he told me that his dad had Parkinson's had been diagnosed so things like that are my favorite situations where you can turn it successfully into a teaching moment as i call it or a moment where you can actually you know pivot on what was bad to something that's really good and, and bring somebody else along and help them understand it so i love actually, that yeah it's great Tom, that's what we live for we're like i'm an activist it just so happens i'm an editor yeah. here's my info let's talk yeah I mean, how many oh, of you drive with a handicap placard? I pulled once into a parking space and the guy growled at me and said, you're not disabled. That's for disabled people. Same. You know what? I'll bring a cane with me if that will help people. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, it's good as protection too, I'm sure. Oh, exactly. So have you all had to do something, I call it playing the... Um, PD card, you know what I mean when I, when I say that? So ordinarily I would not do it, but this is a situation I was in. And it was funny because I was um, on my way to, I think it was a Michael J. Fox patient council meeting. And I was just having this horrible day and I had misplaced my keys and it took me so long to find my keys. I missed my flight. And then they were trying to tell me that they couldn't reschedule me and all this kind of stuff. And so they were like, okay, you can call this number and let them know what your situation is. And so I called the number and I had to tell them that I did have Parkinson's and, you know, I had to go with that. I kind of felt bad, but at the same time, they were going to either charge me like for an extra, uh, 
it was an obscene amount of money to get another ticket or they were going to let me through. So the playing the Parkinson card that one time did, did work. I played the Parkinson's card at Disneyland. <laughs> I was with my kids. It was, a, it was a holiday weekend. It was the most crowded day in the park. And I went up to guest services and said, I have Parkinson's. I don't look it like it, but I have it. And they said, well, you and your family can go in this line and go right up to the front. <laughs> and my kids afterwards said, Dad, it's so good that you have Parkinson's. <laughs> oh my goodness, I love it. Remember that at Disney oh, World. I love it. I was just thinking of Jimmy Choi's story after Tom mentioned the flight. And of course, Disney, he's been around. Someone was on a flight next to Jimmy and he says, Is it catchable? <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy's like, I'm sorry, what? Do you not have access to modern media? You know, this thing called like Google search engines, <laughs> you know, but it was a fascinating conversation after that because Jimmy. Being the classy guy that he is, just like yeah. you, Tom, he was chill with it. I would have been like, get out of here. Can I get a different seat? You know, like, <laughs> you know, yeah. but you guys took the time to, you know, it was great. How many of you experienced the um, have you tried questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the tar oils. On your feet at night, you wear socks over them. Um, have, yeah. Yeah, what are some things people have recommended? Michael, what you got going on over here? Yeah, you got some clicking going on, man. <laughs> You're on mute, Michael. Michael, have you tried? No, just kidding. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. So I have, okay, so this is actually a part of Parkinson's. So I have a hard time sitting for extended periods of time. So I have this desk that kind of like raises up. So that's what I, that's what I was doing. Sometimes I have it where the camera is going to cooperate and I don't have to move it all over the place, but this is obviously not one of those days. <laughs> of have course, because you're on camera. That's how it works. Have you, ever, have you guys ever switched it where you thought you weren't on camera, so you were like doing something like picking your nose or something, and then you turn the camera, you go to turn it off and you're like, oh. Oops. I've done that with the mute button too. Fun fact, <laughs> picking your nose is harder with Parkinson's disease. Yes. And you have to do it more often. And you have to do it more often. Just oh throwing God. that out there. <laughs> All I have to say. Thank you for that. Being in contact is also a challenge. Don't even bother. Oh, I've got one. So I was, I was doing a, participating in a clinical trial. It had something to do with like um, vision and maybe exercise or something. So I had to go to an um, ophthalmologist or what have you. I assumed that he knew that I was in a, in a study or whatever and you know knew what my condition was. But he said to me, I'm going to need you to be still, sir. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I can't be still. Be still. So of course, that made it worse. When I tell you, I'm not a violent person, but when I tell you I want to knock him out. <laughs> <laughs> like, come here, I'll show you still. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah yeah i've heard that at the dentist and and he sometimes forgets that i have parkinson's yeah. and then he always apologizes you know and i'm nervous you know the drill's going it's coming closer and my head's shaking more <laughs> I, I cannot keep a straight face when someone asks me to hold still that just cracks me up yeah. I, I, and that's probably my favorite to to laugh back at yeah. right yeah. i usually like, say if only i out? could if only i could right. i would yeah yeah that's like one saying, of my one of my cousins told me I should get a part-time job at McDonald's as the uh, official milkshake maker. Yeah. Since that machine is always down. It's like yeah. the machine is always broken, but you could just hang out there and just ch -ch 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 shake away <laughs> and it'd be great. I'm like, thank you. I was thinking of all the dumb things I've said to people. Ooh. I remember walking up to a woman and asking her when she was due. She wasn't oh. pregnant. Yeah, I've done that never. too. Never. I never do that anymore. Well, I was young, or how about the time when I walked up to somebody who was working for a major organization in Parkinson's when I was first diagnosed, and she was shaking a little bit this way, and I, and I had asked her a question. So when she did this, I said no. 
what do you mean? No. And then I'm like, Oh my God, I can't believe I did that. So it's like, we all do dumb things, which is like Robin mentioned, like people, she's looking for the love. Like people really do mean well. Mm -hmm. It's very, very rare. Somebody's going to say something on purpose to try to like hurt somebody. There's they're sort of like deer in the headlights. They don't know what to say. And they immediately look at you with pity, like, Oh, I'm like, no, I'm good. But that said, I think sometimes the people, if we are unfortunate enough to run into them, the ones who are deliberately cruel and mean may not hurt as much. This is just a, a, I'm just throwing this out there because you already know the type of person they are or where that's coming from. It's the subtle things that people say unintentionally that can be like, oh, that was painful where they didn't mean to be hurtful. And how do you respond to that and educate that? Or do you just drop it? That's something I struggle with for Example, my mom, whom I love dearly, she's one of my closest friends. She still struggles to accept that I have Parkinson's. It's been, you know, I'm going on to my eighth, you know, obvious year, I guess, maybe seventh after diagnosis. And she says, look, my hands shake too all the time. Maybe it's just that. And she means it so endearingly and so sweetly. But I, I, I honestly don't know how to respond to that. And uh, I have other people who, a few of them who do something similar and they mean well, but yeah, I struggle with that essentially is what I'm trying to say. You know, my, I was in a situation when I was, um, I can't say when I first got diagnosed because I waited a minute before I told my job and my family, but actually um, my father was in town and he wanted to meet for dinner. So I met him at, at the restaurant and I noticed that he had a tremor. And so when I noticed that, it actually gave me the courage to let him know that I had been diagnosed with Parkinson's. The ironic part is he does not, oops. Oops, that's my mom, actually. Um, hold on, Hard to be popular. Okay, sorry Very about that. Very nice sound. Yeah, I should have had it turned down, my, my fault. Um, so that actually gave me the courage to like let him know. And oddly enough, he does not have Parkinson's, he just has a tremor. But I found out fairly recently, too, that his oldest sister, my aunt, has um, Parkinson's. So it's just really, really interesting. So how long did it take you guys to tell your job or your family? Well, I told my family immediately. And ironically enough, the last couple of years, my mother's now been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Wow. And now that she knows the full constellation of symptoms, she's convinced that my grandfather, her father, had it and was never diagnosed. So we know we have it in the lineage in our family, but I've only recently started telling my work because I got deep brain stimulation in 2020 mm. and I told my boss, but I was keeping it very close to the vest, but I give a lot of live presentations. I speak publicly a lot mm. and it's getting harder and harder to hide my symptoms and medication is just getting less effective. And mm. so, um, I've started having to tell, and I have a very public position across the whole state. A lot of people know who I am. It's the only reason I'm willing to do this now <laughs> is because I'm out of the closet at work. But um, I told a friend who I do consider to be a friend, and I, I, it's like I have to do the translation in my head because I know he meant well. But he said, well, if anyone was going to get Parkinson's, I'm glad it was you. And uh, I know that that's not what he meant. I know what he meant was if anyone could fight this thing and not just, you know, collapse and surrender to it, if anyone could fight, you have the fighting spirit. I know that that's what he meant, but that's not what he said. <laughs> wow. yeah. So. yeah, I've heard that a lot. Oh, Sri, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, Robin, to your question, I told my family, I mean, my parents and my siblings, immediately um well then like the first two to three days mm -hmm. there were other people that i told as well that i felt i thought i thought i felt comfortable telling mm -hmm. and i actually kept a list of the date and the name of when i told each person you know because i'm a huge mm -hmm. list person i i love that and i will tell you about 90 percent of the people i told i regret telling because they didn't understand the response wasn't what I maybe would have expected. And it just actually made me feel a lot more tender and vulnerable in telling them. And so when I actually came out of the closet, so to speak, mine was in 2020. 
and I came out on Facebook um, with wow. that I had Parkinson's disease and purely for the purpose of doing advocacy. Cause that's, I think it was 2020 or 2021. I honestly not sure, but it was during the COVID pandemic. And uh, my parents were not happy with me at all that I did that. I, mm. um, they were quite upset and they said, um, why do you need to air out your private business in public? And why do you need to tell people? And I had to explain to them, you know, and I still have to explain to them. And I know many cultures and many people face this as well. It's wow. not just, you know, limited to one, one region of person, but I said, it's for advocacy. People need to know mm -hmm. that someone there out there looks like me, South Indian, you know, American, female, young, brown, diagnosed, who's working full time and trying to fight this disease. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important. And it's still a struggle to kind of get them to understand that I'm public about it. Um, you know, they're still not comfortable with that type of language, but yeah, sorry, long response. <laughs> oh no, that was, that was good. Yeah. I, 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 I'm glad I'm not the only one that uses the term I came out on Facebook because I, I did that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I tell you what happened. I don't know if this got this happened to you all, but you know, told the date um, that I was diagnosed and kind of like a little bit about the situation how it happened. I got flooded. My inbox got flooded with things um, with people saying, "Oh, you're so courageous, and and you you know you're doing you're doing well. You don't look like you have Parkinson's, but you're doing well, and all that kind of stuff." And, and people were coming and telling me that, "Oh." You know, I don't have Parkinson's, but I have an essential tremor or, oh, I, I deal with such and such. And that actually was an encouragement to me. And it kind of like jump started my um, advocacy because I'm an extreme um, introvert. But this the, the condition is actually giving me, um, I guess, some encouragement and courage to like speak to people because people really are out there looking for somebody that they can relate to. Right. Right. Definitely. And that way you're in service. Absolutely. And, and, and the best part of it is with my advocacy, it takes the pressure off me, the spotlight off me. And I don't have time to feel sorry for myself. Yeah. Because I'm focusing on somebody else. You have a purpose. Absolutely. But that helps. That helps a lot to have a purpose for sure. And I think uh, when I was diagnosed, I told, um, you know, my family right away, my wife and my kids, but I also told my business partners almost immediately because um, the position that I was in left me such that uh, they needed to know because I knew after uh, reading about, after getting my PhD in Parkinson's overnight <laughs> that I was going to go downhill and I didn't know how fast at that time, but we all agreed that, you know, we'd pay attention to it as, as partners, business partners, so that I knew someday I'd have to leave or step down or whatever. And I, 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 I lasted a long time working. But when it was time to go, they all knew that we were all comfortable with it. And uh, I, I knew I knew that was my 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 it was my choice. I could have stayed, but I decided to go. And because uh, just being away from that level of stress really, really helped lift me back up into the, you know, have abilities to 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 do these kinds of things, for example. So yeah, I, I, I'm a big believer in telling people right away because, it get, again, it gives you that opportunity to explain to them what it's about. And that's sort of your first step into advocacy, really helping those folks around you understand what's going on. Yeah, yep. it's a big relief of a weight off your chest mm -hmm. when you come out. But I went for years without telling people and sending people ahead to meetings so I wouldn't have to walk with them on the streets so they could see me, how you know, limp. Um, and I was really glad to finally come out, but it did change everything once I, I did come out. Right. You know, the good assignments didn't quite come my way. And the client work that was high visibility shifted. Mm. So it, it's not it, it's it's not an automatic. It's not every situation is easy for everyone to come out right away. In, in my circumstance, I you know, I, I was working, I was a director and a full scope practitioner at a busy inner city or city hospital delivering babies and oh. medical legally, it was not okay yeah. for me to stay and work once mm. there was any question about my ability to do my job. Um, and so Parkinson's, uh, that was, that was a hard, really hard thing for me. I'd worked really hard, um, was kind of at the top of my career. And I really grieved that loss hugely. Um, 
And, and like I've heard others say, stepping away from doing 24 hour call in a high stress arena. And um, I, I, it, it took me some time, but rest helped a lot of my symptoms after a while. So I do think it was the right decision. It was very difficult at the time. Um, and I feel like you, I've found another way to be a midwife to people with um, that are newly diagnosed or being able to be of service in other arenas. But I think if you're, if you're newly diagnosed and you're out there and you're feeling a little bit of that loss, I think you also have to really feel it for a while. Wow. I think you have to grieve what you thought it was all going to be like. Yeah. And, um, and we're talking about what people say and they want to help you. They want to care. It's looking for the love again. And I loved that, Robin. I'm going to, I'm going to use that. Um, yeah. And I think accepting that people, whoever with any new, new diagnosis or big life shift, just listening to people and letting them talk about their process is really a gift. So if you're out there and wondering what to say, sometimes you just have to show up, bring a cup of tea and put on, you know, your good listening ears, what I, <laughs> and, and listen to what it's like for that other person and, and maybe not try to find a solution. Cause as we all know, as of today, there isn't really a solution to offer. Yeah, um, that would be my that's, advice. That's I like what cool. Heather put in the chat about um, using too much energy to kind of keep it a secret and tacking on to that. When I was first diagnosed, I was very, very um, in the closet about it. And I found, I felt such a sense of isolation because at its basic, I wasn't being my most authentic self with people, not that everybody's entitled to know every bit of my business, but I felt like there was this like plexiglass wall between me and other people because maybe I was twirling a pen in my hand and I knew why I was twirling that pen, but they didn't. And it just was incredibly isolating. And so for me, it's been a gradual kind of coming out of the closet. I feel like politically for my job, I had to do it the way that I've done it. But um it definitely feels more authentic and integrated. Yeah, I, uh, number one, Kat, that was a beautiful, beautiful way to put that, um, what you said. And then in speaking to what somebody else said, I think Robin mentioned this about work. Uh, you know, I got laid off from my job um, and not because of anything PD related, just because the company was getting rid of everybody. And then I was totally fine letting everybody know about my PD because I'm like, I'm not going back to work. I'm going to be an artist and a writer and photographer and make, you know, 300,000 a year being a poet, which is completely <laughs> rational. Okay. <laughs> completely rational. And then I realized for my, for me and with my Parkinson's and with my brain and some ADHD, this is not healthy. So I started looking for a job and I thought, oh my God, this is the first time I've had ever had to look for a job and let people know I had Parkinson's. How do I do this? And my old boss at my company knew I did. The entire upper level team supported me. But what I did was, you know, I mean, I have it on my LinkedIn profile, Parkinson's Advocacy, Davis Finney. It is on there. So if anybody looks at it, you know, they will see that. And I, my current boss, I told him, I keep checking in with him. You do know that I'm doing Parkinson's advocacy, right? You do know that, is that okay? And he said, you know what? As long as you're getting your work done, it doesn't matter, which I'm very blessed. But just really quickly, last thing, to speak to what Kat also said about you've had to suffer enough sometimes and accept what you've lost. And sometimes it's the big things. But mm -hmm. yesterday for me, it was not being able to fold the recycled brown paper bag from Panera that held my chocolate croissant. I could not fold this bloody thing and put it in the recycled bag. It drove me nuts. And I thought something I could have easily done in two seconds now is taking me two minutes of concentration. Mm. And I thought, it's just a freaking brown bag. And I just got so sad. And then I had to eat more chocolate croissants. So, <laughs> right? uh -huh. And then you had another right. bag to contend with. <laughs> One of the greatest poems that I enjoy lately is called The Shoelace by Charles Bukowski. And it starts mm. out, you know, it's not the big things that send you to the madhouse. It's that stream of indignities, those humiliating little things, you know, mm. like the broken shoelace when you're running to get somewhere across the street. It's, it's just constant with Parkinson's. We're like the princess and the pea. Everything bothers us and we can't really do a lot. It's like being in peanut butter or wet cement that's drying. 
right? What does it feel like to you guys? Like, what does Parkinson's feel like? Yeah, well, a, it reminds me of uh, something my wife used to always say when, when we were raising the kids. She'd always say, pick your battles. You know, right. if, if, if he wears an earring or she gets a tattoo or whatever, how, how big a deal is that? But with, with Parkinson's, it's, it's really getting to your, your point about folding the bag. You know, in the morning, I can't do hardly anything for about an hour till the meds kick in. So I'm trying to make coffee, trying to make myself something to eat for breakfast. And it's just one of those things where I'll just throw this stuff away later because I it's just going to take me 20 minutes to get to the trash can and back to the coffee. And I got to have coffee first. So it's like, it, it's hard enough to do that. But th those are the kinds of things that I think about, like in, in the general context of this, what you shouldn't say to someone with Parkinson's is what I ask myself, why is this taking you so long? So stop asking yourself, just pick your battles and go with the flow and make the coffee. Time to make the donuts. Yeah, I have uh, some dimension. I just went on disability and I heard someone say that, oh, I was so lucky I won the lottery. Mm. <laughs> oh, wow. And I'm thinking like, I would give anything to still work and not have this disease. That's not a lottery, you know, winning. Mm. Wow. Yeah. You know, that, my that's, first... a good, that's a really good point, Kevin. I think some people confuse um, private uh, disability insurance with welfare, and they're not the same thing. We're not, we're, we don't do the I don't do the welfare thing. I'm sure you guys don't either per se, but I, I, I opted to go with Social Security early as well because and we've earned that. We've well, yeah, earned but, that I mean, our whole working lives. Well, more importantly, it helped me get down to Medicare because when you're not working and, and, and I, was, I was 56 years old, but there's penalties to do that too, right? So, I mean, I'm locked into that rate. So I, I, can't, I can't go any farther, but you know, those are, the, those are financial things and we learn how to manage. But again, that's one of those kind of painful things that people will say to you, oh, you're, you're living on welfare now, you're living off my, my tax rate. And I'm like, well, not really, so. It's almost like uh, somebody tells you, I mean, hey, you're so lucky to get that handicap card. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, thanks to go to Target. And oh, shop, wow. absolutely. Wow. Well, cir circling back up to Sri and Kat's discussion about losses, um, a collateral loss that I wasn't expecting because I didn't know it was a side effect of DBS is I lost my ability to swim laps in a pool. And I'm from Miami, Florida, where I grew up swimming constantly. And it's not like I'm some super competitive swimmer. And I can swim. I have read actually side effect studies where people from Australia jumped in the water and drowned because nobody knew it was a side effect of DBS. But what I find is that I can swim. I mean, I can be in the water and not drown, but the repetitive motion, if I have a really good arm stroke, my legs aren't kicking. And if I have a really good kick stroke, my arms aren't going and I, I can't coordinate that. And um, I got back into triathlons last year. Thanks to the Davis Finney Foundation. And, um, but that's where I discovered that I, you know, I'm coming in last in the swim all the time now when swimming was like my best event. So, and that was, that was a surprising loss. And in, in some ways it hurt more because I wasn't prepared for it. It felt like out of the blue. And I've heard it said that Parkinson's, your world becomes kind of smaller and smaller. And I felt like that was one of those things that that happened that just really caught me off guard and created a surprising emotional response in me. So let me piggyback on that for a quick second. So do any of you find yourself a lot more sensitive um, than you were before? Like, my, and mine goes on the extreme. Sometimes I'll just be watching TV or a commercial or something and I will just burst out and start crying. I'm like, what is wrong with me? And then the other thing is, I, I go into these laughing fits. Um, so sometimes the, the things that I'm laughing at are kind of like inappropriate, but I can't I can't help it. I can't stop it. It's it's just odd to me. It's Michael, that pseudo ball bar effect. It's it's what now? It's called pseudo ball bar effect, and there are some companies looking at making medications for that. It's un uncontrolled laughter and crying. Mm -hmm. You know, in sometimes inappropriate places. It's interesting because we have this facial freezing that happens, and then we have inappropriate laughter. You know, it's like Parkinson's <laughs> is this weird dichotomy. Right. I thought, I thought 
I was crying all the time at Hallmark commercials or McDonald's commercials because my knee, my niece after my nephew was born. I mean, it's just like I never cried before. And then after he's born, I cry all the time. But that was right before I got diagnosed. So I actually, but that was the years before I was diagnosed. So I'm not sure if it's the same thing. I still think it's because he was born and I'm like super aware and sensitive about everything. But the one thing I'm more sensitive about is light and sound. I find it so hard to adjust to loud noises and chaos. A bunch of kids running around, parents talking loudly. You know, my family is very loud and boisterous. I mean, and I never thought I was until I went to my sister's house recently. And I told him like, why are you guys so loud? Why is the TV always on? Why are the lights always on? Why are you always talking? And she just looked at me and I'm like, oh my God, something has changed in me. This is not how I used to be. It's all neurologic stimulus, right? What right. we hear, what we're trying to manage in the chaos, it, it impacts us differently. Our neurologic systems aren't working the way that everybody else's are. And so, and, and I think that's important for other people in our world to know that, you know, I'm, I have been sort of the opposite of Michael. I've been like a lifelong major extrovert and I was the one that hosted all the parties and did all the planning for kids. And, and I just can't do that anymore or, or I can't do it the way I used to. And if I choose to do some of it, I don't feel very good. Right. The noise, yeah. and the chaos, it, what the, the, the 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 trade-off is too great for me and and that you know robin talking about the loss of the swimming and it's incremental loss that we're dealing with and aging is partly <laughs> that right <laughs> but but with parkinson's there's this accelerated part mm -hmm. and this neurologic part and it's and it's it's i think we have to accept some of it, grieve for it, and then try to get to the next right. step before the next one happens, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> before the right. Next so, and that's hard for people that are loving us and trying to be supportive. I, that's the part that I think is hard, gets hard to navigate, you know, and why are you so down or why are you late again? Or, or why, why is that so hard when you could do that last month? Or, you know, it just, it's just different. Um, and I, and I don't know that I have an answer to that, but, but what do you guys tell people, you know, about that progressive, you know, loss that little bits at a time. I told them, I wrote them all a letter when I first got diagnosed, letting them know, um, this is what to watch out for. That was years ago. Now I need to do an update, but in particular, one friend of mine, she sends long text messages, like email texts. And I had to tell her, I cannot process that anymore. <laughs> I can't please break them up into small paragraphs for me. If you break or send me an email, because I, I always would pride myself on being zoom. I could just pick up everything, everything. And I'm still pretty good, but I'm thinking, why am I pushing myself to be how I was before? I just need to tell people, can you please work with me on this? Three sentence, stop space, space, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's worked fine. Yeah. Well, and Heather puts this organizing incoming stimulation is an issue for most of us. And it's such a simple thing, but I was doing a, a meditation sitting yesterday for 20 minutes with my partner and we were in his living room and he has a computer set up and one of the drives was doing a backup and it's almost this imperceptible sound that I don't even think registered for him. Yeah. And I was like, this is my meditation where I get to practice just accepting what is, and I get to accept the fact that this is driving me batshit crazy. <laughs> and when we were done, I was like, can you please turn off that drive? And it took him like a second to even hear the drive. He's like, oh, it's doing a backup. And I'm like, yeah, I need it to stop. And it was just this little pitter pat sound of a drive. And it was driving me. And I, and it's like, how do you, and I said to him, it's affecting me neurologically. I can't explain it other than that. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how to explain it. I just have, you know, eight other people here sort of nodding their head that they get it. We can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Right. Exactly. You notice when you go downstairs, you can't have both your hands full. You have to count the mm -hmm. stairs. Wow. Have you ever noticed when you try to do 
that, that walk in the morning when you trip and you're kind of falling on the floor <laughs> just to get to the bathroom. But if you take big steps and focus and ground yourself and gather yourself, you have a better chance of not falling. It's because yep. we can't jockey too many things at once. I started. Well, I, have an issue. I have a challenge with uh, my depth perception. One of the worst things are I have to be extremely careful when I'm going down a flight of stairs because I think I'm about to step on the floor mm-hmm. and there's like one or two more steps and I end up falling. Mm-hmm. And I'm so thankful that I haven't hurt, really hurt myself pretty bad because that, that used to happen a lot. It's kind of subsided. Then the other thing is I cannot park my car. Yeah. So I'll think that my car is straight and all the way close to the to the to the wall or what have you. I get out of the car and my car is like twisted like that. I'm like, I just can't I can't do it. I've had that so parking hard. problem before Parkinson's, but now it's really bad, Michael. <laughs> Like, how did I, I didn't, know, here? I didn't I know it was Parkinson's related. I thought it was just my parking skills. <laughs> we'll have to blame it on that. Yeah. Like one of the Asian drivers and I'm saying, no, I have a Parkinson's driver. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's another thing that's, uh, that's really curious with Parkinson's is we, having lost my sense of smell for years now. Yeah. One, one of the scariest things people ask me is, do you smell that? <laughs> oh, like, oh my! I, I guess I just get horrified. I'm thinking, oh God, I hope it's not me. Right. <laughs> Has anyone ever told any of you that you're inconsistent? I laughed and laughed. Oh. The new Parkinson's oh. patient told me that. I'm like, you wow. just wait. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a friend who told me that. She said, I didn't understand why. Sometimes you just sleep all the time, but other times you're awake for hours. And yet when I need you, you're not there because you're asleep always when I need you. And I'm like, oh man, how do I explain fatigue and sleeplessness? And I mean, or worse yet, you were fine five minutes ago or half an hour ago or mm-hmm. yesterday. Yeah. And you yeah. that all the time. It's like, you know, they don't understand the ebb and flow of the disease. Right. And it's hard to explain that, you know, yesterday, I could ride 10 miles on a bike and today I'm a bubbling idiot walking across the floor, right? Yes. Like the weather. We're like the weather. Mm -hmm. Such uncertainty. Mm -hmm. How do we manage uncertainty? Chocolate croissants? (laughs) I'm sure. Favorite favorite things people say. What's that? Yeah, I always tell people I'm just taking it one day at a time. That's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Favorite things that people have said or worst things you've ever heard. Is there anything? Go I got around? favorite thing to wrap up. Um, favorite thing is when I said, God, I don't know who's going to take care of me when I get sick. Cause I don't want anyone to do it. I want to be able to do it myself, but what if I can't? And two of my friends completely unexpected said, we'll be there for you. We'll, we'll wow. change your diapers. We will do everything. Wow. And that was, that was made me cry. Still makes me cry. Yeah. Bravo. One of the things that I've heard is from fellow uh, p- people that say that, you know, all the cool kids seem to have Parkinson's. I've never met a Parky that I didn't like. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I read, I one, that a lot. I I read one this morning where uh, uh, to wrap up a conversation, one of the, our fellow ambassadors here at the Finney Foundation said, I didn't pick Parkinson's, but I picked this group. So oh, all you awesome. out there, all my colleagues here on the screen, we're, we're, we keep a pretty good family here. So if you need anything, Take let care us know. Of our, each other. We are really fortunate to have Davis Finney Foundation too, to live better now. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, live now. well today. <laughs> and uh, Polly, you can send any chocolate croissants you want to Kat and she'll get them to me. <laughs> Just throwing that out there, circling back, circling back. Uh, you all are wonderful. Thank you for sharing your experiences. I've just been sitting here in the background laughing and smiling and a little tear in my eye a few times. Um, thank you. Thank you.